solid ground in dry seasons you bring rain Lord God
Jesus, God. Thank you. Thank you, God, for this time, Lord, that we can just come and worship you. Thank you, God, for your grace, Lord, and for your mercy. God, I just want to offer up another prayer for Pastor Roger's body, God, that you would just heal him now, Lord. And also, God, that you would just rush your spirit upon Pastor Doug now, Lord. And thank you so much for a man like Doug who's here and is going to faithfully present your word, God. Because it's what we need. We need more of your word, Jesus. We need more of you, God. That's going to be our prayer, God, for this, these years to come. We need more of you, God. Less of the world, less of us. More of you. Lord, make it so. And draw us closer to yourself, God. We love you. We praise you. It's in your precious name. Amen. Hello. How are you? For those of you know, who don't know me, my name's Doug. I'm usually running around doing all sorts of things behind the scene. And Pastor Roger's sick today, so he asked me if I'd fill in for him. And I'm really always glad to do that. It's an honor to be able to bring the Word of God to you. Um, I was reading a devotion this morning. I, I regularly go through Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. highest. And I'm telling you what, uh, this morning, uh, it maybe it's partly what I'm going to be speaking on, but uh, it really, really spoke to me. And I wanted to share a little bit of it. He started uh, out of Mark 10, 28. He said, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. We have left all and followed you. The Lord replies to this statement of Peter by saying that this surrender is for my sake and the gospels. It was not for the purpose of what the disciples themselves would get out of it. Beware of surrender that is motivated by personal benefits that may result. For example, I'm going to give myself to God because I want to be delivered from my sin because I want to be made holy. Being delivered from sin and being made holy are the result of being right with God. But surrender resulting from this kind of thinking is certainly not the true nature of Christianity. It just really got me thinking, because today I'm going to be teaching out of Hebrews 11. And I'm going to apologize to you ahead of time. I'm not going to be able to go in depth into what should be done. But I'm going to bring out instances of where people showed faith in God. And even through their weak Nesses, God gave them the faith. And through their failures, they still had faith to believe that God could accomplish what he told them that he was going to accomplish in their lives. We have to understand Christianity is not about us. It's about Jesus. Christianity is about us surrendering to Christ and then him making us who he wanted us to be not something that we selfishly do by using some phrases out of context and expecting him to give us what we want based upon these verses that so many people use. It isn't about us. It's about Jesus. Lord, before I ever want to try to proclaim your word I realize what an awesome awesome responsibility it is and whenever any man steps behind a pulpit may he accurately proclaim what your word says certainly I know that's Roger's heart I know it's Gene's heart Trevor's heart my heart God I don't want to be anywhere but where you want me to be so please bless this message and speak forth to your people that which you want them to hear out of this message. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we look at this chapter, it's been called the Hall of Faith because of all the people that are mentioned in it. And if you want to, I'd encourage you when you go home to just kind of look up the verses referring to these people and read their stories. It's an amazing, amazing study. We want to take a look at how God use faith in the, li the lives of these people listed in here. And 
And, I, and let me start with this. I, th I, I came across a great acrostic. An acrostic is where you would take faith, put the F up here, A, I, T, H, right? Here's what the acrostic said, and I've never forgotten. It makes so much sense to me. Forsaking all, I trust him. I'll say that again for note takers. Forsaking all, I trust him. That really sets it up. I think in the lives of most Christians, certainly in my own life as I've been developing in Christ and I'm walking in the Lord, I've been in the ministry now some 43 years, and in my, in my own ministry, I, I think it's been more like forsaking some, I trust him. Or forsaking a little, I trust him. But I'm coming more and more to believe that as I forsake all and trust him, then his will is worked out in my life, and it's way better than anything I could imagine for my life. And he takes me on interesting little turns and twists that I never would have gone on. But I'm telling you, it's the most exciting life in the world. For 43 years, it has been a trip like this. Now, I must admit, I will never understand this side of heaven, why God, at 74 years of age, brought me a baby to raise. So, yes, you can call me Father Abraham. I'm not quite 100, <laughs> but I feel like it. But that little bundle of joy is absolutely, for Karen and me, it's just the love of our hearts. You know, we went through that whole period uh, raising kids where, you know, you, you always associated with the people who had kids, so you kind of did things together. Well, now the people who have kids are so much younger than we are, they go, who are you? You know, we, you talk about not fitting, you know, uh, we are not going to suffer the empty nest syndrome in our house. You know, uh, so um, that's just free. That's not part of the message, okay? I want to start with verses 1 through 3 of, of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So, I mean, here, here these people accepted that, and the writer of Hebrews accepted that. Uh, be, at that time, they thought everything was made of matter. That was the thought, that the whole world, the whole universe was already made of matter. They didn't really, they, by faith, they had to understand that God spoke it into matter. They didn't under, en, understand anything about it. All of the science that we know now, the molecules, molecular structures, they didn't have any of that. They just said, by faith, they believed God. Now, the word substance there is a firm belief or confidence. That's what it means in the Greek. To trust that God will take care of the situation. So, in other words, we believe by faith God is leading us to build a church. Now, the church and the, and the giving that you give for the building fund, it's not for Calvary Chapel to build a, a, a testimony to us as a church. No, it's, it's a vehicle through which we can minister to many people. There's over 70,000 people in this, in this city. We can't reach them here in this little facility. And Pastor and I look at each other and we're amazed that so many people fight the parking and they come here and they're faithful. Do you realize that the special thing about Calvary Chapel is that we're a family, that we're worshiping Jesus and we're, we're, we're teaching and a, a accepting his word as truth? That's what's so special. The evidence is the proof by which a thing is proved or tested. So in other words, we believe by faith that God's going to build a church, right? The church will be the evidence of the faith. That will be the evidence. Uh, let me use it another way. Let's say John Doe here needs a job. So by faith, he believes that God will give him a job. And so he goes to interviews. And he tries and he does knocks on all the doors he can, but by faith, 
He believes God's going to open a door that God wants him to open. He's going to get the job God wants him to get. So that is a, that is a substance. That is the prayer he makes. When he gets the job, that's the evidence. He gets the job. And then his faith is increased. Now, you can't conjure up faith. Uh, regardless of what faith teachers out there tell you, faith in faith, you can't do it, you know. You can stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful, I'm beautiful, I'm be and you're still ugly. <laughs> it doesn't change, okay. You might look good on the inside, outside, but on the inside, you're a mess, just like that. So, so you can't have faith in faith. That kind of faith is a gift from God, according to 1 Corinthians 14.9. says that even that faith, the faith to believe, the faith to come to Christ, that's a gift from God. And believe me, you do not care more about yourself than God cares about you. You cannot have a better plan for your life than God has for you. It's impossible. Now, he may accomplish it the way you don't want it to happen, but you can't make it happen. You can, you can try to help God out, as we're going to see in the scriptures here. People tried to help God out, and they made a mess of things. And I think every single one of us in this room can say, Amen. You know, uh, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. I'll bet you right now he doesn't, he wishes he didn't do it his way. I'll bet you right now he wishes he did it God's way. So let's read verses 4 through 7. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and th uh, through it, he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So what, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is these people, Abraham, came to a different country God had made him a promise that he was going to be a father of many nations, but Abraham died before that became a reality. He died before that became a reality. When, when he, when he uh, died, he had two sons that we know of. We had Isaac and he had Ishmael. Now, here's an example of messing it up. You know, God made the promise to Abraham that he was going to have an heir, Sarah was getting older, and she says, hey, we better do something here, boy. You know, God's not working. So she gives Hagar, her handmaiden, to Abraham, and guess what happened? That's why we have all the problems in the Middle East right now. Ishmael, they became the Arab nations that now hate Israel. How'd that work out for her? Pretty well, huh? But God, God never does it your way. I believe have to look this up, but I'm pretty sure when Isaac was finally born, Ishmael was 14 years old. And Isaac means laughter. And I can understand why Sarah would laugh at 90 years old, having a baby. Are you kidding me? You know, I don't feel so bad. I just look at Abraham and Sarah and I go, well, if they did it, I can do it. You know, fortunately, I have a wife who's a lot younger than me and she's a lot prettier and she has all the energy. But I'll tell you what, don't try to do it your way. You're going to mess it up. So in uh, the story of Cain and Abel, in Genesis 4, 3 through 7, it says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. 
Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and, and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but, it did not, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Anger reveals Cain's heart, doesn't it? Anger is a secondary emotion. It reveals something going on deeper. And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you but you should rule over it. Now, I've heard a lot of teachings on this in my 40-some years as a pastor, and and I've heard everything from, well, you know, it it just was the wrong sacrifice. You know, God wanted this sacrifice, and, you know, Abel gave him a different, or Cain gave him a different one. Abel gave him the right one. No, that's not true, because later on in in Scripture, we see we're, we're grain offerings, you know. So it couldn't have been that. You know what it was? The anger reflected that Cain wanted to give God an offering in his own way. His heart was wrong. It had nothing to do with the offering. It had everything to do with the heart. Abel's heart was good. Cain's heart was evil. So then that brings up another question because we go through, you're going, to see, you're going to look, well, some of the righteous people died and he delivered some and others died. So why, you know, Cain's the bad guy here. Why didn't God kill him and keep Abel around? But God allowed Cain to slay Abel. And herein is the problem if you have that confusion. We don't have an accurate idea of what heaven is really like. We don't truly believe in our heart of hearts that when we die, there's something way better than this. And so if we look at it from a biblical perspective, which is the correct perspective, Abel graduated. He's in heaven. He immediately went to be with the Lord. I mean, all of the garbage that was going to go on on the earth, he escaped. God took him home. And that's the way we have to look at the death of a saint. Yeah, it leaves a hole in our heart and we miss him. But they graduated. If we love them, they're with God. You know? And, And that was the real issue with Cain's heart. And that's why he became angry. Let's take a look at uh, Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Now, let's take a look. at Verse 7 here is one of the, that's the main verse that most people use to believe there was no rain prior to to the flood, that, that there was a canopy that misted the earth. So this is, this is the main verse they use. Well, if that is true, then God told Noah to go out in the middle of a desert and build a boat. Now, I'm not sure too many people even really knew what a boat was in that, and they certainly had never seen an ark. And so God told him exactly how to build it. And here's this monstrosity getting built out in the middle of a desert. I can imagine people saying, hey, Noah, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. Right. What's an ark? Why are you building that? Well, it's going to flood. And, and, and all the people who, who don't believe in God are going to perish. Right. What's a flood? Well, it's going to rain. Right. What's rain? Can you see how difficult this was? Can you see, put yourself in Noah's shoes and, and, and put yourself in his children's shoes? They're helping him. I don't know. Dad told us we're going to have to build a boat. I don't know. I think the old man's kind of lost it. You know, maybe he's been sipping a little bit too much juice, you know. But, you know, he's our dad, so we're going to do what he says. A hundred and twenty years he built that. 
a hundred and twenty years. Now, I've got a little interesting side note on there. There's, in Genesis 6, 14, they talk about the pitch that was put in between the, the boards of gopher wood. This pitch was put in there, and it was to waterproof the ship. That word for that word, pitch, is kofer. In a little bit longer, not, not even 100 years later, that same word was translated kafar, which meant atonement. So right here in the first, in the, the story of the flood and the ark, we have a picture of Christ's atonement there, the pitch being the atonement, the, the protecting them from the wrath of God that could come pouring in if it wasn't there. And Jesus, this is a type of Christ in the Old Testament where we accept by faith Jesus Christ and his blood is the atonement for our sin. Is that great? What a, what a combination. It's also a type of the rapture of the church. As the wrath of God came down and up from the fountains of the deep, what happened to the ark? It rose up. Judgment came down, the ark rose up, and God preserved the righteous people. That's one of the big reasons we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, that before the wrath of God pours down in the last seven years, what we call the great tribulation or the tribulation, God is going to, by his mercy, take his bride up. And this is a picture of that in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited here. <laughs> Let's pick up in verse 8. I could go on all day. This is probably five weeks of messages in one, so I apologize here. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance. He had, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, uh, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose building and maker is God. This is a forthcoming, a, a vision of heaven, of, God, of life beyond the life they had. I'll throw this in, and I'll say it a little later, but the Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. The Old Testament people, they were saved by looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. We are saved by looking back to the Messiah, to Jesus. And so the Old Testament is Christ concealed, the New Testament is Christ revealed. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, amen, amen, <laughs> were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So you see, Abraham believed God. He didn't ever live to see that, did he? He never got to see the, the, the fruit of what God said. He never got to see the evidence. He just by faith believed it. And now we, looking back, we can see God's faithfulness, can't we? We can see the Jewish nation. And, and with, with what Sarah did giving Hagar, we can now see that, that, that if you go back and read the story, there was enmity between Sarah and Hagar. And that never has changed. That's why right now in the Middle East, the Arabs hate Israel. They hate them. That's why it all started there by man trying to help God out. So don't do that. It's not a good idea. And by the way, Isaac means laughter. You know, after all those years, I can imagine she did laugh. You know, 
not, not, I can imagine she just laughed joyously that God finally answered her prayer, that he gave her the child of promise. I'll bet you she just was hilariously laughing. She said, I'm going to name him Isaac, which means laughter. That's cool. As we go through this, this, this true stuff is, you can't make it up. It's absolutely better than anything you could imagine. Okay, so let's read verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That is the city that, where we die. You know, Paul said, he said, to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He also said to be absent in the body, to be dead, is to be present with the Lord. Amen? Amen. That's what he's talking about here. Now, Abraham came from Haran, and if you are a study of any kind of history, over in the Fertile Crescent, Haran was kind of like right up here. And Adam or Abraham had, he was Abram then. God gave him the name Abraham. So Abram had, he was rich. He had flocks. He was, he was doing just fine, thank you. And then God visited him. He said, I want you to go over here to where I'm going to bless you. Now, Mark Twain once said of Israel it was a wasteland and absolutely could, in, uninhabitable, couldn't grow anything. Now, and here's a type I want you to think about God taking people from a, a, a logical situation to a totally illogical situation and then blessing them. And he does that in our lives because he wants the credit. He's God. If we had any part of building this church, we'd take the credit. But it's God who's going to be the... Can you imagine what it's going to be like the first day those doors are open and we see the promise of God fulfilled? Oh, I mean, if that doesn't get you going, I'll do a funeral for you right here after we're done. <laughs> this is good news. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. So let's... The, the story, 17 through 22, let me read that. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Does that ring a bell? John 3.16. Does that ring a bell? Hang on to that one. His only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. I can't go into all those, okay? I'd love to. I'd love to tell you the stories about that and, and draw ties. But I just want to, I want to talk about um, the story of Abraham uh, sacrificing Isaac. It's in Genesis 22, 1 through 19. And there's a couple of key verses there that I want to bring out. They're going over to this mountain where they're going to, he, God told me, sacrifice your son. So he loads the sticks on top of, of his son and they start up the mountain. But before they go, Abraham tells the men that had gone with them, he says, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and the lad and I will go yonder and worship 
and we will come back to you. Now remember, God had said he was going to sacrifice his son. But God gave him this faith. I wouldn't have had that kind of faith. I'd have been so confused. But Abraham said, the son, the lad and I will come back with you. Because he knew even if God required him to kill his son and sacrifice his son, God also had the power to bring him back to life again. That's the faith that Abraham had in God. Isaac demonstrated faith when his father told him that God would provide a sacrifice. He got on the altar in obedience to his father. This is, again, a type of Christ. Jesus got on the cross in obedience to his father for the sacrifice so our sins could be forgiven. If I was Isaac, I'm pretty sure I would not get on that altar. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't let my dad stand over me with a knife about ready to thrust it into me. So we always talk about the faith of Abraham, but I think the faith of Isaac here is something to take a look at. God gave him that faith. He had that kind of faith in his father. The father had that kind of faith in God. And that's still a type of how it should be for us, isn't it? In verse 6, Abraham laid the wood on Isaac and he carried it up the hill, another type of Christ. Isaac carried the wood up. Jesus carried the cross to Golgotha. Isaac said to Abraham, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? And just as Abraham was ready to thrust the knife, an angel of the Lord stopped him, and they pro he provided a sacrifice just as Abraham had told his son. Faith, substance, evidence. God did what he had put in Abraham's heart. Just as Isaac was obedient, we have a type of Christ. Now, let me throw something at you that some of you may not know. Some of you Bible scholars will know this, people who've read it a long time. That very place that Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac is the very spot where Christ was crucified. The very spot. Tell that to people who tell you they can't believe the Bible. The Bible is 100% reliable. 23 through 39. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward by faith. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of, of the blood, uh, lest who who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So let's take a look at Moses there. That's an interesting story because the backstory on this is that the children of Israel were growing so fast, they were multiplying so fast, that Pharaoh was afraid they were going to become more populated than than the Egyptians, and that ultimately they would take over Egypt. So he went to the midwives and he said, when the Hebrew women are to give birth, if it's a male child, kill them. If it's a female child, let them live. And so this is the environment that we're in. Now, I, I love God's sense of humor. They put Moses in a little ark. Again, here was a flood, big ark, Moses in a little ark, and went into the reeds, and uh, 
in Exodus 2, 1 through 4, it says, And a man of the house, Levi, went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi, verse 2. So the woman conceived, bore a son. When she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, laid in the reeds by the river's bank, and his sister stood afar off to know what is to be done with him. You can, now, this is where the story gets good. Pharaoh's daughter just happens, just happens to be down there, and she sees this beautiful baby. God touches her heart. She says, oh, what a baby. This is cute. Picks him up, takes him to the palace, but there's nobody to care for the baby. You know, it's kind of like I want this little toy, but I don't want to take care of it. So she said, go find one of the Hebrew women to care for this child for me. Guess who they found? Moses' mother. What are the chances? So now... <laughs> I love God's sense of humor. Now Moses, who was supposed to be killed, is in the house of Pharaoh, being raised in luxury by his mother for 40 years. Hmm. And then we all know the story. Moses just, evidently his mother was probably telling him the story of who he really was and his ancestry. And so Moses sees these two Egyptians picking on a Hebrew, and he says, hey, look at my people. Again, an evidence of man doing it his way instead of waiting on God. So he goes over and he kills the Egyptian. Thinking, hey, I'm going to liberate my people. So the next day, two of these same Israelis are fighting. And so he goes to break it up. And the one says, what are you going to do? Kill us, one of us like you did the Egyptian? And now the secret's out. So Moses is out. Now, I love the story of Moses because it's 40 years of Moses thinking he was somebody. 40 years of Moses finding out he was nobody. And then 40 more years of finding out what God could do with a nobody. You know, and that, that's a, you're going to find this out of, out of weakness. God shows himself to be strong every single time. By faith, Moses. Moses led the people out of, out, of, out of Egypt. Finally, after all, you know, all of the plagues and everything, and the, the Passover, by faith, God told them, put a, so take some hyssop, put the blood of a lamb above on the lentil and on each doorpost. A cross, the sign of a cross, forthcoming. Take your favorite lamb, perfect lamb, have your Passover meal, kill it, put, the, put hyssop. It's an interesting thing that when Christ was on the cross, just before his final words, they took sour wine and they put it on hyssop and they put it up to him. And after he tasted of it, he said, it's over. It is finished. What was finished? The end of the law. It was finished. Jesus became righteousness for us. He fulfilled every part of the law he paid the price when it was finished it was finished but Moses can you imagine what it was like for all of them coming through the wilderness and they they go down through these mountains on each side and it's getting narrower there's probably about a million people maybe up to three million we don't know but there were a lot of people and they get down here and here the here <laughs> the Egyptians are coming after us after him, and they're at the Red Sea, and there's nowhere to go either way. And God parts the Red Sea. Could you imagine being there? And all of a sudden, it's wide enough, and all these people get across. So the Egyptians start to chase them, and they're drowned. God closes up the waters. I'm told there's a place there. They've, they think they've really found the place where the crossing was, and They've actually gone down and looked, and they found chariot wheels and bridles and things in the bottom of the Red Sea, just like God said. It's totally amazing. We see through the Passover the type of Christ. Christ became the sacrificial lamb. 
God was telling the story of the coming Messiah throughout the whole Old Testament. There are types, all Enoch is a type of the rapture. He walked with God and he was no more. I can just imagine that conversation. Can you imagine Jesus and, and uh, Enoch walking along just talking, or the Lord and Enoch, and all of a sudden he says, hey, Enoch, we're closer to my house than yours. Why don't you come on home with me? How cool is that? How cool is that? Type of Christ in the Old Testament. Type of rapture in the Old Testament. It's all forth told. Verses 30 to 39. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, others were tortured, not accepting the deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had had trial of mockings and scourging, jests and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, all of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves in the earth. All and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. That means they didn't get to see the Messiah. Okay. And then he explains that. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So it, all he's really saying here is that the Old Testament saints didn't get to see Jesus before we in the New Testament did. So they look forward to the cross. We look back on the cross. And Jesus even gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to live within us. Back then, the Holy Spirit would rest on people for a season. But now we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us if indeed we are children of God. And what does that mean? It means that you have to come and get over yourself and you need to bow down to Jesus Christ, ask him to come into your heart, ask him to forgive your sins because he's the only one who can and he's the only one who ever paid for the sins. There are a lot of false Christs out there, a lot of false teachers, but not one of them came out of the grave. If you go to Buddha, if you go to any of the isms out there, and you go to the originator's graves, you're going to see ashes or you're going to see bones. You go to the, the grave of Jesus Christ and you, it is empty because he is risen. If that doesn't get you excited, join the funeral. But I'm telling you, we serve a risen Savior. Now, just for a second, we have a little time. So just for a sec, I want you to put yourself in Joshua's shoes. Now, Joshua was a military genius. He was a general. How many military guys in here do we have, ex-military? Okay, so anybody who's been in the military, especially if you're preparing for battle, you know there's a battle plan. There's a way, there's an approach. We're going to do this. And, you know, we know that... But that Joshua was smart because he sent the spies in. And by faith, Rahab hit them. And they scoped out the land, went back. By faith, she helped him escape. And so she tied a little purple ribbon, hung it out her window so that when they came in, they'd spare her in her house. That's so cool. But it can, here, here we are. So Joshua had done everything right. Now God gives him the battle plan. I want you to go out and I want you to take the whole army and I want you to walk around the city once. Okay, maybe he wants us to scare him. I don't know. Okay, we'll do that. How long do we do that? For six days. What? Six days. We just march around the city once. 
Okay, so what do we do on the seventh day? You go around seven times. What? What kind of a battle plan is that, God? That don't make any sense. But Joshua had faith, didn't he? He said, okay, we will. Can you imagine what was going on in the ranks? What are we doing? We're going to go take care of Jericho. Oh, okay, cool. So what are we doing here? Oh, we're marching around the city. What? Huh? What? What are we doing? Well, I don't know about you, but Joshua said, Mark, I don't know what's going to happen. Behind there. And, and so they, they put the priests and the trumpets and everything out front on the seventh day, and they march around seven times. I mean, by this time, I'm kind of wondering what's going on. And he says, okay, now I want, I want you to blow the horns, and the walls will come down. Well, now, some of the reports I've heard of from people who know, or are supposed to know, way smarter than me, they say that that wall was pretty thick. In fact, that wall was so thick, they used to have chariot races on top of it around the city. So we're not talking about walls like this. We're talking about a pretty massive wall. And I've, I've, some of the people who, again, are way smarter than me have, have, have looked at the scene and those walls weren't just pushed in. They were pushed down. They were crushed. I can imagine big old angels on each part of the wall going, okay, boom, and down it goes. The substance was Jer Jericho. They marched around. That's the faith that they had that God would come through. The substance or the evidence came when the walls came down and, and God gave them the victory. Isn't that amazing? These aren't stories. Archaeologic, archaeological tests. They found these things. They found this, that it's all true. Many people suffered death looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. God gave them the faith they needed in the t at the time they needed it. Again, let's look back. It's not a bad thing to die. It's not a bad thing to suffer. It's a good thing because in the, the disciples even counted it a joy to suffer in the same way that Jesus did. Isaiah, tradition tells us, was sawn in half, put inside a hollow log, sawn in half. But he woke up whole in, in heaven. You know? Jephthah, the son, was a son of a harlot. He was banished by his family of Gilead. They don't want anything to do with him. You can't have a part in it, this. Then all of a sudden, an enemy comes and surrounds them, and they go running for Jephthah. Save us. He said, you didn't want anything to do with me. Well, we do now. He said, okay, if, if God delivers the army to me, then I will be the head of the family. He said, agreed. God did it. By faith, Jephthah took the step. God gave him the victory. By faith, you and I take the step and God gives us the victory. It's not blind faith. It's faith based upon the nature of the one that we serve. Stop the mouths of lions, Daniel 6. Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego delivered from the fiery furnace. And they didn't even know who was in there with them because the Bible tells them it's this Old Testament before Christ, but here is Someone like the Son of Man. How cool is that to have Jesus show up in the middle of a fire? I've been in a few fires. And, I, you know, I want Jesus to show up. And in the last verses, they, they died not seeing the promise of the Messiah. But we have seen the promise of the Messiah. So what does that mean for you and me today? What is that? How can we practically look at that today? Well, first of all, I think a logical message that we should draw from this is trust God even when it doesn't seem logical. If it's not logical, it's probably God. You know, don't be afraid to believe him for deliverance in any situation. Don't be afraid to believe for him. Because what's the worst that could happen? You die. You go to be to Jesus. Poor you. Don't expect God to do it your way. I'll bet you, again, like I said, Frank Sinatra is probably wishing he'd have done it God's way and not his way. 
or to try and get him to sign on to your plan. He really does know better. In Proverbs chapter 3, Proverb number 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. And then, don't be chasing after the manifestations of the Spirit. Now, how many of you saw temptation or the, the new mo uh, movie, Jesus Revolution? How many saw that? Okay, we saw an example of that, chasing after miracles, didn't we? Didn't work out well. Didn't work out well. It, it caused confusion. And, and so, God may be doing something in here. We saw a few weeks ago, the Holy Spirit called people forward, and we prayed, and, and that was a manifestation of God touching people in the heart. And, and, and so we don't, we, we have people come forward, and they pray, and, and God anoints them, and we pray over them. But it has nothing to do with us, okay? Please hear that. Doug doesn't have hot hands, you know? And, and literally, I had one woman say, well, you want Doug to pray for you. When he prays, boy, things happen. I said, no, it's the Lord. I don't have hot hands. Pastor doesn't have hot hands. Gene doesn't have hot hands. It's the Lord. He uses any of us, and I think sometimes he uses the people that are the least likely so that he can move through them so that nobody will look to man. We don't want to look to man. We want to look to the man, Jesus Christ. We don't want to build a church on signs and wonders because if you try to do that, anytime somebody comes to town with a better show, you lose your congregation. We're here to direct people to Jesus and to him only. We're not here to lift up any man. We're here to lift up Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul said, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the saints. That if it's peace and it's orderly, it's of God. If it gets crazy, it's not of God. It really isn't. We believe by faith that God is going to build his church. We are taking steps of faith, but the Lord will build it, and he will provide. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So it's totally okay to plan. It's totally okay to let your desires be known to God. But make sure they're godly desires. And then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Get in line with Jesus. Get in step with Jesus because he's never taken anybody to a bad place. And God is the only one who cares for you and your family more than you do. So at this time... Uh, Pastor, we'd like to call the board, our financial board, uh, up here as the team comes up. And uh, as they come forward, we're going to have uh, one of them pray over the uh, offering. And uh, uh, I want to in introduce to you as an opportunity for you to meet the members of the financial board. And uh, believe me, all of these guys with us as elders and as pastors, we've been praying over this uh, for a long, long time. So this man here is Ryan Harshish. You don't usually see him. He's hiding in that little room back there, as is this is Alan Moore. He's, does all of, he makes us sound good, and I always keep him on the good side because he could turn me off in a heartbeat. <laughs> and this is Cy Baxter. He used to be a Border Patrol guy, and fortunately he re retired. And now we keep him busy. You know, it's amazing how busy you can keep a guy when he works for nothing, right? <laughs> and Cy, Cy is on our board. So I've asked, Pastor and I've asked Cy, if he would ask uh, the blessing over the, uh, this week and the, and the contributions that come in. You know, uh, we have, we've heard the word of God today. And if you happen to be in a situation where you feel like, God, you know, I... I really need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to pray a prayer in just a minute. Just a simple, it's not the prayer, it's not a magic prayer. Just the attitude of your heart. 
acknowledging that you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, acknowledging that you, you can't do it on your own, bowing the knee to the man who can do it all for you, inviting the power of the Holy Spirit to come and reside within your heart and to overflow you with love and peace. If you've never accepted Christ and you have that desire to do so, I'm going to pray this prayer and Pastor Gene's here. I'll be up here afterwards. Just, just come up and tell one of us, Trevor. Tell one of us that you came to Christ today so we can rejoice with you. The Bible says that there's rejoicing in heaven over one lost soul that comes to Christ. So, Lord, we come to you. And I come to you on behalf of the one or maybe more in this room who do not know you as Lord and Savior. And I ask if that's their desire, they would just simply repeat, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe what the pastor said today. I believe what the Bible says. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart right this moment and be not only my Lord and Savior, but to be Lord of my life. I turn my life over to you freely right now. And I thank you for the salvation that is now mine because of the blood of Jesus 